turn to 2 Kings uh, chapter 18. You know what? I asked you to turn there in your Bibles. You're just going to have to race along because today the text is 2 Kings chapter 18, 19, and 20. So I don't have a verse today. I have three chapters that I want to use. Uh, last week, I looked over the auditorium. I looked over this crowd and I asked everybody who was in the Christmas spirit. And the number of hands that went up was an astounding zero, unless I missed uh, whose hands went up, unless I missed your hand. We had zero hands that went up last week. That was so exciting. You should have been there. <laughs> Nothing. Who's in the Christmas spirit? That's all I got. That, that's all I got back. This year's been tough to do what's normal because, well, nothing's really normal in 2020. Nothing's really normal this year. Maybe you usually fall into that Christmas spirit when you see the Christmas party starting to be scheduled. You know, maybe it's an office Christmas party. Maybe it's a church Christmas party. Maybe it's families do Christmas parties or whatever. But this year, there, isn't, there aren't any Christmas parties being scheduled. You know, it's kind of a, um, you stay over there, we'll stay over here, Merry Christmas. You know, that's the, those are the parties this year. Not a whole lot of that happening. Maybe, maybe that Christmas spirit kicks in for you when you start traveling to go see family members. Maybe you travel to see family members or the family comes to see you. Um, you're going to see mom and dad or grandparents or uh, the, even your children. Maybe that's when the Christmas spirit kicks in for you. This, but this year, uh, there's not a whole lot of that happening either. There's not a lot of travel happening. And maybe you're one of those people that, where the Christmas spirit kicks in when you experience the chaos of Black Friday shopping. There are people like that. <clears throat> My wife likes that stuff. And I, I am the protector of the home <laughs> while she's shopping. She gets a friend and says, let's do this. And I'm like, I got everything here. I'll lock the doors and I, well, I'm protected in the house. I'm, I'm that husband, you know. You go out there where it's scary and I'll stay in here and take care of the kids. Yeah, I'm that guy. Uh, she, like, she loves shopping. But you can give me any day of the week. Um, not Black Friday. It could be in the middle of, I don't know, May. I still don't like shopping. I'm just not, I don't like shopping. But maybe the Christmas spirit kicks in for you when you experience the Black Friday shopping type thing where you go out and you see the crowds and you talk to people you haven't seen in a while and you get those good deals off the shelf and you know you're going to have gifts under the tree because of all the great deals you found. Maybe that's what kicks you into that Christmas spirit, that feeling of Christmas. But this year there weren't any crowds and not very many deals. It's 2020. It's the magic of 2020. It's complete despair, death, uh, doom, gloom. That's everywhere we look. It's just not that Christmassy type feeling this year. Christmas seems to be been affected in a negative way, just like everything else this year. So let me help bring everyone back into the reality of what's being masked by the circumstances of Christmas this year. I want to bring everybody back into reality of what is being hidden, not not what we're seeing, but what we're not seeing this year. Jesus still came. The Son of God did still come down here and die for our sins. Salvation is still absolutely 100% free. These are tr it's true. This is still intact. Nothing's changed there. Christmas is a celebration about what did happen, not an anticipation about what will happen. We have to understand Christmas isn't about what's going to happen on December 25th this year. It's about what did happen over 2,000 years ago. That's what, nothing's changed there. Nothing's changed. But the perspective has changed because our circumstances have changed this year. I think we could all agree it's not the same feeling this year <clears throat> for anything. You want to go shopping? Eh, it's just not the same feeling. Nothing's the same feeling this year. Everything has changed because of this uh, event we call 2020. The reason we're not really feeling it this Christmas is because our routine has been disrupted. That is why we're not really feeling it, that Christmas spirit, that Christmassy excitement that we have at this time of the year. R the reason we're not experiencing that same thing is because our routine's been disrupted. And I think we would all agree that the reason for the season has not changed. The reason for the season's still intact, locked in, carved in stone. It's, it's not going to change. Jesus Christ is the reason for this celebration that we have. That is what it's about. It's not going to change. I think we could all agree to that. What's changed is the way we feel this year. The reason our feelings have changed is because our routine's been thrown off. That's 
tr the truth about the way we feel about a lot of things this year. Um, we got new clothing this year. Everybody get some new clothing? Yeah, yeah everybody got one? How do you feel about that? Huh? My routine's been changed. I have feelings about this. You have feelings about this. Um, maybe you have feelings when you see somebody wearing one or not wearing one. It's changed your routine. Everything this year has been, our routine's been thrown off in, name the topic, it's been thrown off this year. I want to look at the dangers of a disrupted routine. And I also help to restore a little bit of that Christmas spirit that seems to be, have been stolen this year. I, I'm, we are, we're a week and a few days off. We're, next week is Christmas week. We're getting close. Where's the Christmas spirit? I was telling the teens the Christmas song for 2020 is Where Are You Christmas? Why Can't I Find You? You know that. You know, that should be the theme song for Christmas this year. Where is it? Well, it's, it's not in 2020. It's, it's over 2,000 years ago. That's where it is. You want to find Christmas. It's back there, not in the future, but in the past. 2 Kings chapters 18, 19, and 20 give us the story of King Hezekiah. The kings of Israel followed the example of one, the one of two kings in Israel. Some followed after the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was a king that took the heart of people of the Israel and took it away from God. They shifted the heart of Israel from God into false idols. Then you've got King David, who was the man after God's own heart. The, the kings of Israel followed the example of one of two of these king, one of two of these kings. Hezekiah chose to follow in the steps of David. Hezekiah is a good king. He was, he was a very good king. By the time Hezekiah becomes king, Israel has gotten themselves into a little bit of a pickle. They've, they've gotten themselves into a, a situation. They had built altars in the high places. They have set up these altars in the high places for idol worship. They also still had the brass serpent. You remember the brass serpent that Moses stood up in the wilderness and everybody would look at the brass serpent. If they got bitten by a snake, they would look at the brass serpent and they would be healed. That's what God told them. You look, you live. It was a picture of Christ being raised up on the cross for us. That was the whole picture. Well, at King Hezekiah's time, they still had this brass serpent. They're still carrying this thing around. Then this 25-year-old king shows up. He steps in and does a complete overhaul. They're still worshiping. They are worshiping this brass serpent as a god. Isn't it amazing? God gives us so many things and we end up worshiping the things. We're brilliant. We're brilliant. I'm going to give you this snake and it'll help you with your medical issue when you get bit by a snake. Cool. Then when that whole event's over, like, oh, worship snake. Why, why, why? God gave you the snake to help with the snake issue. Why would you worship the snake? Why not worship the God who gave you the snake to help you with the issue? No, they, they are now worshiping the brass serpent. Hezekiah walks in. His 25-year-old king walks in and sees this mess, and he does this overhaul. So look at 2 Kings, starting in chapter 18, verse 4. It says, He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. Hezekiah walks in and starts building a pretty impressive resume. 25-year-old king walks in and says, okay, we've got high places, altars set up for other gods. You're, still, you're worshiping a piece of brass. You've given it a name, which by the na way, Nehushtan means piece of brass. They, they were creative. So um, you're worshiping a piece of metal. You've set up altars to false gods. Um, your heart is not chasing after God. This is wrong. So he starts tearing everything apart. 25-year-old king steps in and starts flipping everything over. Hezekiah, has, he's starting to build up a pretty good reputation here, a pretty good resume for a king. He's bringing the nation back to God. His father was a wicked king that allowed Israel to wander spiritually. His father's name was Ahaz, and he was not, uh, he followed the sins of Jeroboam, not David's example, but Jeroboam's example. He also put them in a bind economic and, economically and politically. King Ahaz was a terrible king, he's an awful king. During a battle, he reached out to the Assyrian army for help. 
And with that help, he agreed that Israel would serve Assyria. And he actually took the gold and the silver from the temple to pay for the Assyrian king's services. Ahaz isn't a, a good king. Like, hey, we need your help. We will serve you. And here, take what's God's and we'll pay you with that. Hezekiah, however, chose to take the nation in a different direction. So uh, look at verse 6 of 2 Kings 18. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. So <clears throat> Hezekiah knew that Israel was supposed to serve somebody. He just knew the king of Assyria was not that person. Hezekiah knows, yeah, we are supposed to serve somebody. It's not, it's not all about me. We are supposed to serve somebody else, but it's not you. We're not supposed to serve the Assyrian king. We're supposed to serve the king of kings, the Lord of lords. So we're going to go ahead and switch our allegiance back over to where it's supposed to be. So he chose to break the agreement that was between his father and the Assyrian king. We're going to break this off. We later find out that Hezekiah does pay what is owed based on the previous agreement, but there are, we're not going to be any future payments made. He says, okay, we'll keep the agreement my dad made with you, but from here on out, it's over. We're, we're switching. We're going back to God. The Assyrians really don't like Hezekiah's decisions. I mean, if you own somebody and that somebody says, oh, by the way, that's just stopped. You don't own me anymore. Um, you can see why the Assyrian king isn't in favor of this decision. But that's the decision Hezekiah makes. So the king of Assyria threatens Hezekiah's people. We understand that's what, what would happen. What's amazing through all of this is the fact that Hezekiah is in over his head every single step of the way. Every step of the way, Hezekiah, you're the little guy. You're, you're the little guy. He's just the little guy trying to do what's right. That's, he's just one guy. Remember, the rest of Israel was worshiping old, old piece of brass. That's what they were worshiping. He turns the nation back to God, but he still stands alone. He's just a little 25-year-old king. Comes in here to turn the nation back to God and goes to the Assyrian king and says, hey, it's over. It's over. You're in over your head. You're in way over your head. But he's just trying to do what's right. The Assyrian, the Assyrian army far exceeds Hezekiah's army. Hezekiah is one man standing alone trying to do what's right. So when Hezekiah hears that the Assyrians are going to attack, he sends messengers to Isaiah, the prophet. This is what Isaiah tells Hezekiah's messengers to tell him. He sends messengers to Isaiah. Isaiah says, okay, take this message back to Hezekiah. Look at chapter 19 and verse 6. And Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. God basically tells Hezekiah, don't worry about the scary stuff. I'll handle that. Uh, he, Hezekiah is shaken up. The Assyrians said, okay, we're going to come and wipe you out because you're not, you're not with us. You're not serving us anymore. So they're threatening Hezekiah and Israel. He goes to God and God says, I'll take care of the scary stuff. I'll, I'll go ahead and take care of the scary stuff. You remain faithful. The, your job is to remain faithful. And God blesses Hezekiah's faithfulness. Hezekiah has built a routine in his life. He has built a pattern that he follows very closely. He's removed all the things that pulled Israel away from God. And he's run to God in the times where circumstances were shaky. What does Hezekiah do when the Assyrians threaten him? He doesn't say, okay, well, let's look at our military. Let's look at what we've got. Let's go ahead and figure out how we're going to solve this. No, he goes to the prophet. says, would you talk to God for me? Because I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared right now. God says, hey, I'll take care of the scary stuff. You just stay faithful. I'll, I got the scary stuff. You just keep doing what you're doing. Follow the routine that you built for yourself. He, Hezekiah knows that God has to be his go-to every time. Every time. When things get shaky, it's God. When things are going good, it's God. When the Assyrians are going to slaughter me, God's my go-to. I've got to go to God. I, he's built a routine. 
anything that happens, I go to God. So God honors his faithfulness by having the king of Assyria destroyed in his own land. If we were to continue reading in chapter 19, we would see that the Assyrian king was killed by his, in his own land by his own sons while worshiping his own gods. So the king of Assyria is in the temple worshiping his false gods. His own sons come in and kill him. Just like God says he'll fall by the sword in his own land. Then one of his sons take the throne. And Israel's still the target. Remember, they still don't like Israel, but now we've got a new king on the throne in Assyria. God has blessed the life that Hezekiah chose to live. And he fought the battle for Hezekiah. I got the scary stuff. The Assyrian army's coming. They're a whole lot bigger than me. What should we do? Well, you just remain faithful. I'll take care of the big stuff. I'll take care of the Assyrian army. So if you read, the, go, I, I encourage you, go back and read the chapter, but you'll see the series of events happen. They do hear a rumor. Um, they end up fighting among themselves, basically. His sons kill him in the temple of a false god and problem solved. Hezekiah, what are you doing? I'm just being faithful. I'm just following the routine. I've got a routine I've set up. I'm just staying faithful. Yeah, but what about them? He said he had the scary stuff. So I'm doing the not scary stuff. I'm just staying faithful. That's all I'm doing. As we turn the page over to chapter 20, we see that Hezekiah gets sick. We're, you're getting the highlights of Hezekiah's life here, okay? From He's 25 years old, now we move forward. Now he's sick, okay? So it's progressing quickly. He gets sick in chapter 20. And Isaiah comes in and he tells Hezekiah, oh, by the way, you're going to die. That's, <laughs> that's all the news he gets. You're going to die. See ya. And then Hezekiah, or Isaiah starts leaving. This is when Hezekiah revo- reverts to his routine. Chase after God. I'm sick. Prophet just told me I'm going to die. It's time to follow the routine. Hey, God. Hey, God. Look at what he says in chapter 20 and verse 2. Then he turned his face towards the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He doesn't want to die. But he, he just got the news from Isaiah, a trusted prophet, you're going to die. So he goes to God and says, hey, I just want you to remember me. Just remember me. I have been faithful. I have chased after you. I have followed you. And I don't want to die. Hezekiah is asking God to have mercy on him and remember that he has chosen to make godliness his routine. I have chosen you. I have made a godly life my routine. Just if you could remember that. And when he prays this prayer, God tells Isaiah to turn around and go back and give Hezekiah another message. Now, if you read this, you'll see what's happening is Isaiah comes in and says, God wants you to know you're going to die. You're not going to recover from the sickness. See ya. He's leaving. Hezekiah is praying. And on Isaiah's way out, God says, hey, uh, turn back around. Go talk to Isaiah or Hezekiah. Go back and give him another message. Now, this is an unusual event, but it shows how much God respected Hezekiah's faithfulness. What, what we're about to see here is completely unusual. Don't don't. Don't expect that. Don't make this your life verse and say, that's going to happen to me too. No, this is unusual. But look, God respects Hezekiah's faithfulness. Look at what happens in verse 5 of chapter 20. Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, and God, or the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord And I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my or for the sake of my servant, David. Go back. Tell Hezekiah. What am I telling him? Tell him he has 15 more years. I just told him he was going to die. Tell him he's got 15 more. What went on in there? Okay, I'm going back. I'll tell him you have 15 more years. Even when Hezekiah fell into hard times, he did not turn his back on God. He remained faithful. Even, oh, by the way, you're going to die. Okay, I'll just go talk to God about this. I I need to talk to God. He has made following the Lord his routine from the very beginning. Even hardships couldn't sway him. 
Assyrian army's coming. That's right, I'll go talk to God. You're going to die. It's okay, I'll go talk to God. This is my routine. This is when Satan tries a different tactic, a completely different tactic. Change the routine. God is his routine. I've tried to shake him up with an Assyrian army, and he's still going to God. Try to shake him up with the idea of death, and he still goes to God. His routine is God. God is his routine. So change the routine. Let's change the routine, and let's do it subtly, very subtly. Remember, that's how Satan works. You're not going to see him coming. Why would you? He does things subtly. He doesn't tell Hezekiah to stop serving God because it's obvious that that's not going to happen. That is Hezekiah's way of life. It is his routine. He doesn't send in trials because Hezekiah seems to get closer to God during the trials, not farther from God during the trials. So let's not send trials. So Satan chooses to attack Hezekiah by changing the routine. Subtle, so subtle. Let's just get him to skip a beat. Let's change the routine a little bit. That's all we've got to do. The king of Babylon, not the king of Assyria, that story is behind us, but the king of Babylon hears about how the Assyrians had failed to take over. Uh, we hear the news. The little tiny guy somehow chased away the Assyrian army. That's big news. He's also heard that Hezekiah is sick or was sick. So he sends him a glorified get well card. The king of Babylon hears, okay, the Assyrian army ran from the little guy. The little guy was sick, and now the little guy's not sick anymore. Let's send him a get well card. Let's, let's just wish him the best. Look at chapter 20 and verse 12. At that time, Baradoc Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah was attentive to them and showed them all the house of, the, of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointments, and all of his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. The king of Babylon just killed the Israelites with kindness, and Hezekiah doesn't even know it. W did anything go wrong? No. They came here and said, hey, we heard you were sick. We brought you a gift. We brought you gifts and letters and we're just, hey, get well or get well stuff um, or not get well, but congratulations conquering the Assyrians. Congratulations bouncing back from a death sentence. Hey, great. He sends the king of Babylon just sent ambassadors with letters and gifts to Hezekiah saying, great, good for you. Good for you. This makes Hezekiah feel important. Don't you like it when somebody thinks about you? And they, they, with kindness, maybe that call just to say, hey, just been thinking about you. Makes you feel good. The king of Babylon thought, let's make him feel good. Just send him gifts. Let him know. And it makes him feel important. So he shows these ambassadors everything that is under his dominion. I'll show you how God's blessed here and let me show you how God's blessed here and here. Let me show you everything. It doesn't seem like a scary situation yet. <coughs> His routine was always to follow God, but this event is giving him some recognition and he does like it. He does like it. Remember, he's been fighting alone all this time. He's, he's the one guy that turned the nation back around. He's been, I mean, he doesn't have a big crowd following him and then finally another nation says, hey, Good job. Good job. Well, come on in, sit a while. Let's talk. Let's, I, I like this. I do like this. Second Chronicles tells us what the problem is here. Because if you look at the situation at face value, like, yeah, they just, they just wished him well. And he says, yeah, I, I'm, I'm enjoying this. So let me show you everything that God's done. It doesn't seem like a bad situation. Second Chronicles tells us what the problem is. Second Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. 
Hezekiah just changed his routine. That's all that's happening here. He's changed his routine. He's not glorifying God. He's enjoying his own glory. The routine was interrupted. Subtle. So, so subtle. I give glory to God for everything. Hey, great job on conquering and beating death. And that, I'm getting some recognition finally. I'm getting glory. I thought your routine was to glorify God through everything. Yeah, but right now, I'm getting a little bit of glory here. I'm getting a little bit of recognition here and I'm enjoying this. Routine just got interrupted. You just disrupted Hezekiah's routine. And in doing this, he has shown the Babylonians everything there is to gain if they ever choose to conquer. Let me show you all that we have. Everything we have. And God knows that this is ex exactly what they will want to do. You showed them everything. Yes. Why? What's the problem? Now they know everything they can have if they conquer you. You just revealed everything, including your armory. You let them know everything. So God sends Isaiah back in to talk with Hezekiah. Isaiah is a busy guy in this story. You feel bad for him a little bit, man. You're just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is the message God gives to Hezekiah. Look at 2 Kings 20 and verse 17. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated unto this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. This is not good news. Why? You showed them everything. You, you left your routine. Your routine was to glorify God and everything. And as soon as you started getting some glory for yourself, you, you kind of absorbed that glory, that recognition. And now you've shown the Babylonians everything. They know what they want and they know what you have. And those things are the same. I want what you've got. We're going to take over. And it says that one day, some of your sons will be taken and made eunuchs to serve in the palace of the king of Babylon. When we look at the book of Daniel, we see that this is exactly what happened. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, conquers them and takes them into Babylonian captivity. And look what happens. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 3. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. The fulfillment of this prophecy is where we see Daniel's story begin. Hezekiah, because you let down your guard, because you did not stay with the routine of godliness, one day your descendants will be taken into Babylon, made eunuchs to serve in the, in the king's palace. And this is where we see Daniel's story begin. Hezekiah had a godly routine in his life. He reminded, he reminded people of who God is. You're worshiping a piece of brass. Worship the God who gave that gift to you to protect you. Go back to God. He remained faithful through everything. But when the struggles subsided, when the bad times left, when the armies weren't threatening him anymore, when he wasn't sick anymore, he let down his guard and he got into a different mindset. The routine has been disrupted. Daniel's life was affected by Hezekiah's disrupted routine. Years later. And, and please don't miss this. Future generations can be affected by the choices that we make today. They absolutely can. Our generation is affected by previous generations' choices. Even today. Don't let your guard down. Please don't let your guard down. Make sure your routine is godliness and stay with the routine. Stay with that. Don't, don't waver. Daniel's life was affected 
But this is where hope is brought back into the story. And right now it's looking pretty negative, but this is where hope's actually brought back into the story. Daniel chose to atop, adopt a godly routine himself. You know the story of Daniel. This was, a, this was a strong man of God here. But Daniel purposed in his heart not to waver. Not only am I going to make God my routine, a godly lifestyle my routine, I'm also purposing in my heart that I will not waver. No matter what comes, I'm not going to make the same mistake that Hezekiah made. I will not waver. He knew that a walk with God was not just going to happen. It must be intentional. By the way, that applies to you too. It's not just going to happen. A godly walk, a walk with God doesn't just, hey, I'm saved, so now I walk the right path. No, it doesn't just happen. It's not just going to happen. It's intentional. You have to make up your mind. You have to purpose in your heart to make this your routine. It's not just going to happen. Daniel lived to be an old man. During, and during his uh, time in Babylon, he impacted the Babylonians for God. Even King Nebuchadnezzar turned his life to God because of Daniel's influence. Daniel had a big impact on that country. Daniel made a huge impact on the world, not just Babylon, because he refused to be swayed from a godly routine. I will stay faithful to God. In Hezekiah's story, we see the danger in drifting from a godly routine. And in the Christmas story, <clears throat> we see the importance of standing firm in one. Oh, look at that. Well, we're in Christmas. I thought we were talking about Hezekiah. Then it was Daniel. Now we're in Christmas. Now let's go to Christmas. The Christmas story actually tells us the importance of standing firm in a godly routine. Let's jump over to the Christmas story real quick. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. The word wise men is actually a magi, a term which designates an order of priests and philosophers which belonged originally to Persia and Media. That's where that, it connects you back to the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon during the reign of King Darius, whom Daniel served under. Daniel is there when Babylon is taken over by the Medes and Persians. In order to have a Persian royalty seeking Jesus to worship him, there must have been a godly influence in their history somewhere. Who's coming to worship? Who's bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh to worship? Not the Babylonian king, but the king of the Jews. We come to worship the king of the Jews. And, it, and they're talking to Herod, who's the king of the Jews? Herod, where's the baby, the king of the Jews? I'm the king of the Jews. It's not that king. We're here to worship the king of the Jews. Shouldn't you be worshiping the king of the Medes and the Persians? Now we're here to worship the one true king. How do you end up with Persian royalty bringing gifts to a baby at Christmas time? Not serving the Persian king or the Jewish king, but the true king of the Jews. There had to have been an influence somewhere in their history. Something happened back here to create this day. Something changed. Someone taught them to seek after the Son of God. And they did. They were seeking for the Son of God. Daniel's story is not plastered with events that give us warm and fuzzy feelings inside. Read the, read the story of Daniel. That was a, that was a tough chapter right there. Uh, you, you, I wouldn't want to go through that. Daniel was even thrown into a den of lions. Not, I'm not in that line. I'm not standing in the line. I don't want to turn. I don't, no, thank you. He was thrown into a den of lions, and he was thrown into a den of lions because he refused to be swayed from a godly routine. Just don't pray. I'll go talk to God about it. I said, don't pray. I, yeah, routine. Godly routine. I will not be swayed. He was thrown into a den of lions because he would not be swayed from a godly routine. 
right now, in 2020, we are being affected politically, physically, financially, socially, and economically. We are being affected in every single one of these categories. But we cannot allow these things to change our godly routine. We cannot let it change us spiritually. It can have all the other categories. You can have the physical, the economical, you can have the social, you can have all this stuff, but you cannot have the spiritual. You cannot have that. It might change me in all these other ways, but I will stay with a godly routine. We cannot let it have that. It's not time for God's people to sit back and wait it out. It's time for us to stand up. We've got to stand up. Is it scary? Sure. What does God say? I'll take care of the scary stuff. You just stay faithful. You just stay faithful. Yeah, but it's really scary. I'm really big. You stay here, be faithful. I got the scary stuff. I've got the scary stuff. Jesus Christ is King. Merry Christmas. Jesus Christ is King. God is still on the throne. The Word of God still works to change people's lives. It still works. And it's important for us to surround ourselves with these truths. Is COVID scary? Yes. Does God's Word still work? Yes. I'm going on the God's Word side. It's really scary. He's really big. He's really big. Yeah, but the kings, the kings of the world tell us to be scared. Well, the king of the Jews says, come let us adore him. Adoration can be my feeling rather than fear. Yes. Yes. Adore him. Adore him. But the kings, but the king, the individual, keep the routine. Keep the routine. Stay faithful. Yes, there is political turmoil in our country. No kidding. Yes, the coronavirus is out there. And I'm not trying to downplay the importance of taking care of yourself. Please take care of yourself. Please don't hear my message wrong. Take care of yourself. But do not allow the circumstances of this year to affect your godly routine. Do not do it. Can it affect you socially? Yes. Politically? Yes. Economically? Financially? Yes. Spiritually, absolutely not. I will not waver. I will stand firm. It's my routine. You can affect this, this whole circumstance can affect us anyway, but it cannot, it cannot dig its claws into my spiritual growth. I will not let it happen. I will stay with a godly routine. Restoring the Christmas spirit was, by the way, never my objective for this sermon. I know at the beginning I said I hope to restore a little bit of that Christmas spirit. Well, if, you, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Hopefully, hopefully you'll be more excited about the Christmas season because of what we are celebrating. Not because of what's coming, but because of what came. But that wasn't my objective for this sermon. It just makes a really good illustration. We have lost that amazing feeling which comes with this time of year because our routine has been disrupted. That's why we're not feeling it this year. It's because our routine has been disrupted. Let's just be honest. That's all that's going on. Yeah, but the things I normally do that get me in that Christmas spirit, I can't do this year. Okay, so your routine's been disrupted. That's why we're not feeling it this year. Well, the same thing can happen to the fire that we have to serve God. Some of you may feel helpless right now. That truly, in this room, that could truly be happening. Some of you may feel helpless right now. Some of you may feel completely apathetic. You just don't care anymore. I just don't care anymore. Who are you rooting for to be president? I don't care. When's, when do you think the coronavirus will be over? I don't care. Merry Christmas? I don't care. Yeah, we're, some, some people become apathetic because of circumstances. So maybe some of you are feeling even a little apathetic. Some of you may have learned how to fear this year. You learned how to fear. And some of you may just feel completely exhausted by all of this. And I had more response on that last one than the rest. Exhausted. Yeah. Yeah, me. I'm exhausted. I, I get it. I get it. I want to show you a verse that not only refers to people, but to any evil or negative influence you may have in your life. 
I want to show you a verse that applies to not just people, but to all negativity, all evil, all corrupt, negative influence. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. You want your routine changed? Let it in. Let negativity just send a get well card. That's all. Just a get well card. Just a simple, allow the negativity to come in. Allow the evil to come in. Allow the wicked things to be turned on your television. Allow the music that's not pleasing to God or pulls you away from God to come in. Allow these things to happen in your life. What will eventually go down? Your godly routine. It will change you. Do not allow the negativity to disrupt your godly routine. Please, please don't do it. I'm looking forward to Christmas because what makes Christmas Christmas has already been fully accomplished. It's, it's already accomplished. I'm that guy that they say, hey, are you closer to the Grinch or that elf movie? Which way would you see your... I'm ashamed to say it, but I'm placed in the category of the elf guy. <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> I'm that guy. Our Christmas decorations went up on November 1st. I'm that guy. I'm like, Christmas. Why? I don't know. It's just exciting to me. It's, be, it's because that's the day that my God came down to save me. That's the day when God Himself, which you could not kill, was placed in a body which you could kill to take my place. It's Christmas. That's exciting to me. I'm, I'm that guy. I'm excited about Christmas because what makes Christmas Christmas to me already got locked in. It's already happened. My year can be good or bad. It doesn't change why I'm excited about Christmas. I enjoy celebrating that day. I'm also looking forward to coming back here next week to see all of you again. Now, I'm excited about that. And hopefully more. Hopefully more. Because I'm excited to see what God's going to do in and through this church. I'm excited about that. I've not been derailed. I'm still excited to be a child of God. I'm, I'm just that guy. Are you, are you upset? Are you depressed about this year? No. We have church on Sunday. I open up a, a love letter that God wrote to me every single day. Is Christmas ruined? How are you going to do that? It's already over. It already happened. The event went down. You might not like it. You might not believe in it. But it did happen. Well, maybe we're big enough to erase it. He's bigger. You can't destroy that for me. I'm just that Christmas guy. I like Christmas a lot. An embarrassing level, a lot. I like Christmas. I want it to smell like Christmas. I want it to look like Christmas. I want it, I want it to sound like Christmas. I like Christmas. We cannot allow circumstances to change our godly routine. Circumstances is what changed that Christmas spirit that we normally feel. The reason why it's gone is because our routine got messed up. We cannot allow the circumstances to change our godly routine. Don't lose that. Don't lose that. When Israel was taken into Babylon, Babylonian captivity, God sent the prophet Jeremiah in with an important message. And I love this verse. Not Isaiah, not the Hezekiah-Isaiah relationship, but the Jeremiah-Daniel era. God sends Jeremiah in with a message. And I want everyone to see why this message is so important. Look at Jeremiah chapter 42 and verse 11. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you are afraid. Do not be afraid of him, says the Lord, for I am with you to save you and deliver you from his hand. Was the captivity a real issue? Yes. Yeah, it wasn't. Some little issue. It was a big one. Was it affecting their lives? Yes, it absolutely was. But God wanted them to remain faithful with a godly routine in the middle of everything. Daniel 
was one of the people who listened to this instruction and inadvertently connected the Babylonians to the Christmas story. I'm just going to stay faithful. I'm just going to ride it out to the end. I'm going to stay with you, God. What if it gets bumpy? Well, hold on. Because I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm going with you all the way. If Satan can get you to wander from a godly routine, you will change your habits and eventually your lifestyle. It will happen. Daniel went through some pretty rough stuff when he was in Babylonian captivity. But his routine is what connected the bad situation to Christmas. That's his routine. Stayed, he stayed faithful. If Jesus Christ chose to return today, I promise you I would be in complete favor of that. Yes, 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 yes. I will push you out of the way in that line. <laughs> I am so in favor of Jesus coming back today. Let's do it now. Let's do it now. My prayer is that whenever he does return, that we are found faithful. And we are found faithful. Make God and godliness your routine and do not waver. Do not waver. I understand the coronavirus is scary. God's bigger. I understand the political issue is shaky. God's unmovable. I understand circumstances, they're intimidating. I understand. I, I do. I understand that. But we need to be in the house of God whenever we're able to be in the house of God. Churches all over this country, their attendance is dropping. And it's not all because of health. I mean, there are a lot of numbers out there that are affected by sickness. I, I understand. But not the majority of the reason why churches are losing people is because they're afraid. It's because they're afraid. Call me crazy, but I ain't scared. I will be here every Sunday. Because my God's bigger. My God's bigger. Make godliness your routine. Make it your daily routine. Don't open your Bible on Sunday because, well, you found it in time for church. You should know where your Bible is because you spend some time with God every day. Every day. It's your routine. You run to Him when things are shaky because you're standing with Him when things are good. It's your routine. It's what you do every day. Make godliness the routine in your life. It can have everything. Politically, socially, economically, physically, it can have it all. But it cannot have spiritually. That category is not up for grabs. I will remain faithful. Stand with me as we remain faithful, following God through it all. And understand the Christmas spirit isn't be Black Friday isn't what it's all about. Those Christmas parties, that's not what it's all about. The traveling to see family, it's nice, but it's not what it's all about. It's about one family member that traveled a long way to connect other family members. That's what it's all about. Jesus Christ. So spend the rest of this week and into next week, get into the Christmas spirit. All the situations can change everything, but it can't change what Christmas is all about. Make godliness your routine. By the way, thank you for all of, all of, to all of you for being here today. I wish you could hear it from my heart. It means the world to me to see you sitting where you're sitting. Because I know a lot of pastors out there are struggling right now because their people aren't there. They're not there. They've devoted their life to help people grow spiritually and they're running out of people. Some churches have had to shut their doors because there's not enough people coming to church. That's happening. But I look around this room right now and you're still here. So please don't hear it from my lips, hear it from my heart. Thank you so much for making godliness your routine. Don't let it waver.